It's the Get Published Radio Show. And here's your host, Gerald Everett Jones, the guy who has the answers because, well, he's made all the mistakes himself. Today I want us to consider the notion that historical fiction is all about today. I'm sure my famously opinionated co-hosts Cheyenne Cockrell and Tom Page will have a lot to say about this. You bet. Historical fiction has to be my favorite genre. Well, I wrote some of my sci-fi books so long ago, I guess you could consider them historical, and me too. (laughs) And then we have, of course, Tom, we have your throwback essays that we run as show promos. You're, you're a history buff, Tom. Guilty as charged. Our featured guest is Catherine Delore, author of historical fiction, including the books Mistress of the Revolution and For the King. She blogs at Versailles and more and has an incredible following. And she's practiced immigration law, dividing her time between France and Los Angeles. I have to say I'm not objective about this because I've read her books and I'm a huge fan. Welcome to Get Published, Catherine. Well, thanks for having me. Catherine, I wanted to ask you about some of the characters that you focus on and kind of how that's mirrored in today's world. So a lot of your books tend to center on female characters struggling to survive. And how would you say that's similar or different from kind of what women go through today, their plight? Uh, I think today in the in the first world we are very lucky as women because we have access to education we we are more or less protected by the laws of our countries we have access to a professional career and that wasn't the case until recently and that's still not the case in much of the world today Many women do do not have access to any kind of education. They are still uh, second-class citizens, assuming they are even considered citizens in their own countries. So I think um, that kind of very low status for women is still, uh, still happening in much of the world today. Well, it seemed to me, Catherine, in reading your books that There was a strong flavor of, shall I call it, sexual politics. And I mean, I know that the struggles were different. You know, back then, if a woman didn't marry well, her choices were nun or prostitute. But what do you think of the notion that historical fiction is all about today? I think it's very true. I think historical fiction is about today, and that's why people like and read historical fiction, that's why they watch historical movies, that's why they read historical non-fiction. I think people are fascinating by the past because the present is a very often a repeat of the past. Well, what is it about the French Revolution that so fascinates you? Oh, it's, a, it's a turning point in the history of Western Fort. Fort weren't, you born, weren't you born on the 4th of July? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Did I hit a nerve there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was, uh, I'm a firecracker. <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't. I suspect you a that's whole true lot too. Wait in France. In France, I would have had to be born ten days later. That's you know? funny. <laughs> that's actually my birthday, July 14th, French Independence Day. Oh, oh my! <laughs> we have we have a sisterhood going oh, here. Right. <laughs> Tom has a question. Catherine, mistress of the revolution, has a rags-to-riches and back-to-rags plot, which you share with many writers like Balzac. I'm wondering just exactly how those stories resonate today with you. Well, I think it's a very, very universal uh, storyline, and that's a reflection of of a life story of real people. Um, uh, people who are born into into rags want to rise to riches, and that's a normal human endeavor. And yes, yeah, I see that in um, in many historical figures, and I'm particularly fascinated by those historical figures. Well, and of course, today we've got a fascination uh, with uh, it's a with universal 1%. universal uh, storyline. 
an excellent plot engine, but I think also among your fans, you know, the idea of um, opening Vanity Fair magazine and seeing how the other 1% live, you know, that is, there's a fascination there, certainly. Your book for the king is about the time of Napoleon. Is Napoleon a character who fascinates you or resonates with you? Fascinates me, yes. <laughs> yeah. He, it's difficult not to be fascinated by him. He was um, an extraordinary man, not from my standpoint, not from a, from a military angle, but he was a, a political genius. Well, didn't he step in into a power he, vacuum? He managed Catherine? to turn really dismal defeats into huge PR victories. <laughs> to yeah. me, that's a lot of a political genius. That sounds like it resonates with today. That's a real stunt. <laughs> No, but when he came to power, didn't didn't he didn't he step into the it was you know the revolution hadn't I don't know whether I'd say fizzled, but it didn't really follow the same arc that it did over here in in America. Yeah, the, the very very different revolutions. You, you, the American Revolution was a, a struggle for liberty, but also for independence from uh, what was perceived as a foreign power. When the French Revolution was um, a revolution against what was perceived as a, as a system that couldn't evolve, that couldn't reform itself, that was uh, totally sclerotic. And then any attempts at reform, which had been um, done by the king himself before the revolution, really? all these attempts, oh yeah, yeah, he was, uh, Louis the Sixteenth was a, a fairly brilliant man. He was uh, not a brilliant politician, unlike Napoleon, but he was a, a very intelligent man, and he realized that uh, reform was indispensable. But he didn't have the political skill to implement it. He tried and he failed. And a couple of years later, he had the French Revolution. And at the beginning of the revolution, he was still extremely popular, and people considered him the head of the revolution. Well, you're, and, cer uh, you're certainly but he, an expert. He couldn't handle it, and uh, things turned violent, and uh, things uh, evolved in a way where all of the old order was uh, overthrown. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, Get Published is all about helping you. Yeah, I mean you get published. And these days, the way to go is self-publishing, where there are no agents or editors or big publishing houses telling you you can't or making you feel like you're not good enough. You know, going back in history, many famous authors were self-publishers. With his own printing press, Benjamin Franklin published Poor Richard's Almanac in 1732, long before he was a famous statesman. That's how we know Ben's sayings, such as, Fish and visitors smell in three days. Seriously, if you want to change your life or change the world or both, it's a great time to get in the game. Ebooks are particularly easy. With a click, you can reach a worldwide audience. Did you know that there are more people in China who read English than those of us who use the language in all the rest of the world? So if you've got a story to tell, write that memoir or that novel that's been percolating in your head. And if you're an established professional, or if you have a job you dislike or no job at all, give us that business or technical or even political book that establishes you as an expert who deserves serious attention. Yes, it's easy to get published, but understand you'll need help if you want professional results. Editors and copy editors help you clean up your prose, book designers make the product eye-catching, and publicists help you be heard above all that social media noise. We have those support resources on our website getpublishedradio.com. And there we've also got a request for services form where you can get personal attention for whatever might be keeping you from getting it done. That's why we say getpublishedradio.com is your doorway to unlimited self-expression. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. Use it or lose it. Welcome back as Gerald and his co-hosts speak with historical novelist Catherine Delore. I know that you actually, after you finished the manuscript, or at some point when you were uh, developing Mistress of the Revolution, you decided to query agents if you wanted to go with mainstream publishing, and you succeeded. Can you tell us about that process? Did you consider self-publishing, or did you just knock the ball out of the park the first time and 
the rest is history. I know I wanted to get published, and uh, I would have gotten published uh, some way or, or other, but I was very lucky. I started sending queries. Very quickly, I had two agents who were interested in uh, representing me. And I would have been really over the moon with one agent. I had two. The difficult part was to pick the the agent uh, who was going to represent me. And I was very, very lucky. And then my agent was lucky representing me as well because she got competing offers from publishers very quickly. So I was... Uh, it's just dumb luck. Well, the quality of your writing, of course, is going to be paramount. But I would think also topic and your, you know, your 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 historical Absolutely. romance genre is very, very, very popular with with especially women. It's forever you. popular. Yeah. Are you familiar with a novel called Forever Amber, going back for many years? That thing still keeps coming back into print, and it's not as good as yours, but... <laughs> there we go. Oh. Well, the plot is... Uh, <laughs> no, really, it isn't, but... Well, uh, we need to see feature films for Mistress of the Revolution and for the That's true. That's true. Yeah, you know, some really old, uh, fairly old uh, historical novels are still in print and they are still being reprinted. And that's, uh, I think the genre has really uh, an enduring appeal. Well, I think it does reinforce our, I mean, our, the topic of our show today is historical fiction is all about today. And I think it does reinforce the idea that particularly women readers, although, you know, I felt a pull you know, into your subject matter and your stories. But I think there is, like we say, a resonance. I think that there is an identification with, again, you've got this, you have this female character. She's starting low and she aspires yeah. to rise high and then she rises high and she's got to get involved in all this court intrigue and she, you know, she has to play favorites and she has to manipulate and she has to use all of her wiles. And then, you know, despite all of this, and along comes a revolution and rocks her boat and, and, um, it's an incredible ride, I, an, an, emo, an emotional, you know, roller coaster. I think it described the plight of women in those days was worse than than it is today, and sometimes today it's pretty bad. But this, you struggle, you're struggling in a class society. I mean, one, to, of, one of the biggest parallels I see is with this book and kind of what's happening today. Yes, women have been working for so many years yeah. to get what we have now in our first world countries, which is, you know, as Catherine said, much better than back in those days. But now women have this kind of overwhelming feeling that we're backsliding, that Congress is passing things that are affecting things that we changed years and years ago that we fought oh, for trying years to put ago. them back where they used to be exactly yeah, they're trying to set law. They're, Overturning yeah. law. they're trying to put women back yeah. in their corner where they go where they think they go <laughs> um, back so to that 1950 was, yeah oh that, 1890 was, i would say yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's more appropriate for them. They like that better. <laughs> well, it was, it was Before hard. Teddy Roosevelt you know, started, <laughs> oh, both of the Roosevelts ruined everything, you know. Well, it was harder in the French Revolution, even, even uh, in comparison. So this is quite an impressive achievement, this novel. Well, you know, I, I mean, to hand it to Kath her. Catherine's written about uh, Napoleon, I mean, uh, and, and talked about him as a politician, but I mean, as a lawmaker, you know, that was, Catherine, was that not world-changing Napoleonic code? Yes, and you know, uh, the striking thing about the Napoleonic Code is that people consider it a major achievement, while well, actually it was a totally uh, reactionary uh, text. It uh, took women's rights way back. Sometimes wow. the situation of yeah. women, the legal status of women under the Napoleonic Code was worse than before the revolution. Notable that you write in English. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> Masterfully. It, it out, Mr. I, I wasn't, I, wasn't uh, I hesitated a lot in the beginning between writing in French and writing in English. I don't know why, but I, I decided to write in English. And it turned out that that was a very, uh, very clever decision, although I did it know it at the time because uh, French publishers don't want to publish my novels. Really? Why do you think that is? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I <laughs> wish I knew. <laughs> You're politically incorrect, is that? <laughs> Maybe I'm politically incorrect. And I've talked to um, 
to French agents or agents used to working in France. And those agents told me that French publishers see me as purely American, which obviously I'm not. I'm American, <laughs> but not purely American. They don't like it. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a traitor or something. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, now, you've got a, that blog, Versailles and More, and I, th I think... You're one of the more successful people at social media. You've got an incredible following, and and the it's impressive how long the discussion threads are on your posts. Do you have any insights or secrets or tips for authors who want to really engage people? I think it's pretty easy. You oh, have to really? work <laughs> a lot at it. News to me. You have to spend a whole lot of time okay. at it. That's easy in a way, and it's difficult too, because when you spend so much time on uh, social media, you curtail your writing time. So it's very difficult to find a good balance between your presence on social media and the need to find time to, to write, especially as, as you mentioned, I'm an attorney too, so I need to find time to practice law as well. You're fighting uh, a good I fight, I understand. There's no secret, really, but there's a secret is how to balance all of these things. Well, Catherine, we've, it's been a delight having you. And as you have probably heard, Get Published Radio is all about the First Amendment, and you've, you've helped us reinforce that concept. So thank you for being with us. And the, your books, again, are Mistress of the Revolution and For the King. Read them. Thank you so very much. Get Published Radio will be right back after this message. You know, in all the history of the world, with today's technology, it's never been easier to get published, to self-publish your printed book, ebook, audiobook, even multimedia ebook, and not just novels and memoirs or how-to books and histories, although if that's what you've got, let's have it but also poetry, spoken word, graphic novel, cartoons, children's picture book, interactive video, games, virtual reality, and imaginative mashups of all this stuff. Get into the game. Along the way, you'll no doubt need some professional help from an editor, a book designer, a publicist. But isn't the investment in yourself worth it? How about you take the money you'd spend on your next vacation and get famous instead? GetPublishedRadio.com. That's our support website where we've got links to all the resources you'll need. And don't forget that request for services form if you crave some personal attention. That's GetPublishedRadio.com. Hey, it's all about the First Amendment. You can use it or lose it. You know, Runky Productions, the audio magicians can take your radio shows, podcasts, audiobooks, and ads from the streets of New York to... Outer reaches of the galaxy. I think we need more echo at the end of that. Now look, visit us at runkeeproductions.com. I still think we need more cowbell. Today's topic is historical fiction is all about today. And I'll be using a thrilling example from a notorious Verdi opera. So, get comfortable or... Set the pace on that treadmill or make sure the waiter has your order because we're going to the opera. I want you to consider the notion that historical fiction is really all about today. The example I'll use is actually from an opera, Nabucco by Giuseppe Verdi. It's one of the most beautiful choruses ever composed. The Chorus of the Hebrew Slaves. The Italian song title is Va Pensiero, loosely translated, Let Us Reflect. It's about Jewish people 3,000 years ago enslaved in Babylon. Quite simply and movingly, they're singing about how much they miss home and how they'll probably never get back. Nabucco has traditionally been an enormously popular opera. One remarkable performance was in March of 2011 at the Opera House in Rome. Typically, this chorus gets a standing ovation. The show stops while the audience claps and cheers. On this night, maestro Riccardo Muti stopped the show and addressed the audience, and he gave them a stern lecture. 
Muti drew an analogy between the chorus of the Hebrew slaves and the fact that the Italian government had just cut the budget for the national opera. And he was saying, if you don't fund the opera, we will be missing our culture just the same way the Jews were longing for their homeland. This is our national identity. This is our story. This is who and what we are. He quoted a line in the chorus, O mia patria si bella e perduta. O my country so beautiful and so lost. He was scolding the audience many of them rich donors, but particularly the government of President Silvio Berlusconi. Then Muti instructed the audience that the chorus would be sung again. They all had the lyrics printed in their programs, and he invited them to sing along. The audience was back on their feet, and they joined the company in singing the encore. There were tears in some eyes, and it concluded as people tossed their programs into the air in what looked like a shower of confetti. Now this score was not only inspiring, it was a deep throwback to the history, not only of the Hebrew slaves, but also of this opera itself and the more recent history of Italy. In the first year this opera was performed in 1842, the audience also demanded an encore. But at that time, Italy was ruled by the Austrians and encores in the opera house were strictly forbidden. But this time, Verdi got one. So ever since, in the mind of the Italians, this chorus has become an anthem an anthem of defiance. When Verdi composed this, Italy was going through a period that historians call the Risorgimento, the resurgence. It was the reunification of Italy, which was a collection of fragmented regions with a weak central government, which left a power vacuum such that the Austrians ended up dictating to them. Of course, Italy wanted to be its own country, break away and assert its national identity. This chorus became the rallying cry for the Five Days of Milan in 1848, in effect saying, let's be Italy. We want our soul. We want our country back. So in Verdi's day, were there tears for 3,000-year-old slaves? No, they identified with the powerful emotions for their immediate personal reasons. Presumably, this is why Verdi picked the material, or perhaps his subconscious just found a way to invest his everyday concerns in the work. Now, in our time, it happens again. Muti picks this opera for the night when he decides to chastise the government for gutting the arts. And during this encore, with the audience joining in, even the performers are starting to cry. Is Muti trying to send a message about 3,000-year-old people? No. Is he trying to defy the Austrians? That fight is over. He cares about funding for the opera and how much that means to the Italian national spirit today. Now, when the audience is singing and crying, are there tears for the opera? Well, perhaps the singers in the chorus. No, the audience is crying from feelings of deep patriotism for Italy. This performance was during the 150th anniversary of the Risorgimento. This song was the unofficial national anthem, and since then, Italy has been devastated by two world wars. After World War II, people were impoverished, and it was essentially a broken country. And today, eh, they're still crazy and with challenges, but relatively prosperous. To be an Italian is to resonate with Verdi. So, no matter what you pick, whether it's Moby Dick or the historical novel you're going to write this year, remember, it is all about today. Feel that sense of responsibility. Feel that sense of curiosity and inspired awe. Ask yourself, why am I so passionate about this story? What is it about this piece of history that tugs at my heart? If you've been listening to this show, you probably already know some of the story behind why I wrote Bonfire of the Vanderbilts, about a hundred-year-old painting I saw in the museum. Well, I'll give you a clue. It's about the 1% of yesteryear. It's about arrogance and power and love and betrayal. It's about how the mighty can fall. Here, listen to the slaves as they sing. They are choosing not just to complain and give up, but to make their song loud and defiant. Either like Solomon to the fates, you present a sound of crude lament, or the Lord inspires in you a song which takes courage into the depths. And that's our show. You know, Get Published is all about self-publishing and self-expression. And that getting published and the ease of getting published these days is really all about exercising the First Amendment in this free society of ours. You know, what we need these days are more ideas, 
Even though we're deluged in, with information, we need more good ideas. And we need debate about those ideas. Book-length debate, not just snippets that are posted on social media, not just selfies and cute pictures of your pets, the things that you really think. And remember, because in self-publishing there are no gatekeepers out there, that is the good news and that is the bad news. So hire some good help. Perhaps you found that here. You may find it on the website, whatever you're looking for, whether it's an editor or a book designer or somebody to help you promote. But hire good help, get good advice, and by all means, please get published. The Get Published Radio Show with Gerald Everett Jones is produced by Runky Productions. Our producer is Lori Marple and your announcer is Bill Navarro. Music by Jason Shaw. You'll find links to support services on our website, getpublishedradio.com. So whether you're an author, a publisher, or a self-promoter, get help at getpublishedradio.com. And thanks for listening.